Objectively speaking, the trouble was entirely of my own making. Half an hour ago, I was at Hotel de Boer for a drinks reception. It was to celebrate the successful opening of a show, but it was draining my energy. So, I waited for the right moment, then snuck away so I could switch to standby mode. Um, probably because I'm playing the lead role in the show? Is that so surprising? I'm always getting invitations to do solo performances. I just usually get Linny to write back and turn them down. But then came the Fontanalia Film Festival. We took all the kids from the House of the Hearth out to see a film. And after it finished, they all started clamoring for me to try out acting for some reason. Even Linny was chanting along with them. Anyway, it just so happened that a director called Mary who had sent me an invitation right around then. I'll spare you the details, but basically, I ended up accepting it. Yep, you nailed it. I'm playing the role of a puppet. In fact, the show's called The Lost Puppet, and it's a masked mime show. So, I don't have to do any facial expressions or say any lines. Literally just a series of physical movements. The director says it's a very avant-garde art form. Art is not comprehended by the mind, but felt in the heart. At least, that's what the director says. Anyway, if nothing else, the opening performance seemed to go down well. At the drinks reception, everyone was crowding around me, saying, Triumphant character portrayal. Faithful adaptation of the original work. Unequivocally, quintessentially avant-garde. And stuff like that. But... Being the center of attention is draining. So the moment they left me to go harass the director instead, I was out of there. The other thing is, some weird things happened while I was on the stage. Oh, <laughs> sorry, Bonnie. I didn't mean to leave you out of the conversation. My bad. No, we just met. We bumped into each other right after I slipped away. Well, it'd be kind of difficult for us to communicate otherwise. Besides, I think she's taken a liking to the name, haven't you, Bonnie? Yeah, that's right. Good kitty. We'll go find your owner soon, I promise. Nope. She's wearing a collar, and for the most part, she's pretty well-groomed. If she is a stray, she hasn't been for long. Her stomach's been growling a lot. I guess she must have been missing for a few days now. As much as I'd love to hang out with her for a while longer, her owner's probably worried sick about her. Assuming she has an owner, that is. <sighs> but the reception... I should probably show my face there again at some point, even if it's just to make excuses and leave again. Mm, decision time. Well, I just find it exhausting, thinking through all the different ramifications of different choices and so on. That's more Lenny's area than mine. So, unless it's something really important, I usually just leave the decision-making to him. It's fine. He got Fermine to make me a little something for just this situation. Poof! A photometer. It looks pretty over the top, I know but it's essentially just a box of cards. He kept the design simple, so it'd be harder to break. The way it works is, I pick a card at random, then look at the number on the card. Well, for example, if the number on the card is five or higher, I help Bonnie find her owner. If it's less than five, I go back to the reception. I just have to believe in the bond between me and my cards, and my fate will reveal itself to me in numerical form. 
At least, that's what Linny said. Anyway, I guess I'll give you a demonstration. Huh, I didn't like that. Was I using it wrong? Hmm, maybe if I just... Clearly, there's some design flaws to iron out. I'll have to let Fremenet know. Let's see... Which card did I get? Four. Well... The cards fell on the ground, though, so I don't think it counts as fate. If you want to get the right answer, you have to let fate decide. Also something Linny said. So, to put it another way, if picking a card up off the ground is how to not leave it to fate, then that means it must be the wrong answer. Um... Or... Why don't you pick a card? Since I ran into you here, that means... Uh, our fates are, like, interfering with each other. Thank you. This one is final, I promise. Here, take the fatometer. If it's five or above, that means fate successfully changed. Anything lower than five is a fail. Also, if you have your own thoughts about what I should do, feel free to share it. Now that I've got a good problem solver here to help, I don't need to run every little thing by fate. So, we're looking for Bonnie's owner? Um... I think I'll go to the Steambird and see about putting an ad in the paper. You wanna come along? I think Bonnie wants you to come with. Every stupendous day starts with a steambird. Oh, hi, Lynette. Hi, Traveler. What can I help you with? Hmm, I don't think so. Have you picked up a stray? Yep. If there's no commission to follow up on, could we post a notice about the missing cat instead? Why, of course. What a kind thing to do. Just fill out the form. Well, we've registered you as missing. You can stay at my place until your owner finds you. Also, I just wanted to say thanks for keeping us company for so long. Well, I should probably head back to the drinks reception. Hopefully most of the people have left by now. If you've got some time, you should stop by my place tomorrow to see Bonnie. There's a nice cup of tea in it for you. All right, see you then. I believe this cat belongs to me. I already told you, this isn't your cat. Uh, just take a breather, you two. Oh, you're here. As you can probably see, you'll have to take a rain check on that tea I promised you. At least for now. This is my friend's cat. He's preoccupied with some important business, so I came to retrieve her in his stead. No, no. It's far more likely this cat to escape from the Humane Society. Uh, Bonnie? Uh, that's the name I've given her in the meantime.
Well, this complicates things. I told you before. This is my friend's cat. It's normal for her not to trust me. Listen, I'm the director of the Humane Society, okay? We've got so many strays, dogs, cats, you name it. I'm not even the one feeding them most of the time. You can hardly expect the cat to recognize me. She just looked somewhat familiar, so I came to check, just in case. If she turns out to be one of ours, I'll take her back. Simple as that. Even if that's not the case, the Humane Society could still take her in. If no one else comes to claim her, that is. Ah, we're an organization that specializes in rescuing and sheltering stray animals. We've been in business for several decades now. I'm Bernard, the current director. The Humane Society... Huh. The name sounds familiar. I remember hearing good things. Near the one in the Cartier Lyonnais? Yes, yes, that's the one. Anyway, um, if it's not too much trouble, could I possibly take a closer look at the cat? If it turns out I really am mistaken, I suppose that means the cat belongs to this lady here. She would be the only remaining option, after all. It belongs to my friend. Go on, Bunny. Hmm... Oh, nope. Looks like I was mistaken. They do look similar, but there's an ever-so-slight difference in this one's fur color. Deepest apologies, friends. Well, I suppose this means I still have a missing cat to search for. Apologies again for the confusion. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, uh, yes, exactly. Wait a second. You lied earlier, didn't you? Lied? I'm afraid I don't know what you mean. A liar always has a tell. The look in their eyes, their breathing pattern, the way they hold themselves. The things that can give you away are often more numerous than you would think. What are you talking about? The way I see it, you're conflating baseless conjecture with fact. Normally, when someone is called out, their breathing speeds up as they begin to panic. But your breathing pattern hasn't changed one bit. In fact, it's been strangely calm and measured this entire time. It stands to reason, then, that your agitated behavior earlier was all an act. If you're a bad guy, I'm sure you'll take off running the first chance you get. If you're a good guy, the most likely explanation is that you're a member of the Guards, or some similar organization. <laughs> and you're basing this off of... Intuition. Nothing more. <laughs> Intuition. Well, I have to hand it to you, Lynette. You're right. I'm a member of the Guards. The name's Elodie. I'm currently investigating a cross-border smuggling case. This cat here... Bonnie was her name? Well, her owner is one of the prime suspects of our investigation. A couple of days ago, our suspect got wind that we were on his tail and fled. That's most likely how he got separated from the cat. I just so happened to stumble upon your notice in the Steambird. So, I decided to see if he'd come back for her. But, it looks like I overestimated him. The impact of this case has been huge. The Marichose Phantom, the Guards, and the Special Patrol have all launched investigations. If there was even the slightest chance that he would show himself, I had to follow up on the lead. A new kind of illegal drug, imitation synth. We confiscated all the synth on the market, but addiction isn't something that goes away overnight. Even without substances on the market, people are still looking for a way to get their next fix. And criminals are all too eager to capitalize on that addiction. That was the impetus for imitation synth. Needless to say, a small-scale market opened up very quickly. After the original synth debacle, we put several measures into place to prevent similar incidents from occurring. The perpetrators got smart, though, and shifted their sales overseas before those measures could kick in. That's when the imitation synth smuggling began. We only recently got word of the presence of imitation synth overseas. We managed to track down evidence of some early transactions. What we were able to find out, however, hasn't proven that useful given the amount of time that has passed. 
The Mars Chose Phantom launched an investigation to track down every person in Fontaine capable of producing a drug like that. That's how we learned about Bonnie's owner. He's a researcher at the Fontaine Research Institute. His name is Pierre. Pierre Lafever, to be exact. Lafever. The Marchose Phantom found him in Poisson. In addition to the cat, he also had a pendant with him. At first, there wasn't much cause for suspicion. A search of his house didn't reveal much to go off of either. The Marchose Phantom very nearly left it at that. It was only later that we realized the coat of arms on his pendant belonged to none other than the Lafever family, one of the most infamous aristocratic families in Fontaine. Obviously, this discovery prompted a further investigation into Pierre. At that point, however, we discovered that he'd already fled. Now the guards and the special patrol are all searching for him. That's not possible, actually. The Lefebvre family has been gone for a long time. Exactly. Many years ago, several important members of the family, including the patriarch, were murdered by an assassin of unknown origin. From that point on, family's power and influence took quite the hit. The family is engaged in all manner of crimes. As you can imagine, there's no shortage of people waiting in the wings to take their revenge. And with the family severely weakened, they were able to do just that. Most of the remaining family members succumbed to sickness or hunger. The ones that survived are currently living out their days under a new identity. Pierre is one of those very survivors. He's been hiding away in the Fontaine Research Institute all these years. His true identity unbeknownst to all. Until now, that is. Well, my fellow guards have told me all about how smart and courageous you both are. And I know you possess a strong sense of justice. There could be a chance that Pierre, or one of his accomplices, might attempt to get close to Bonnie. Now that you've been briefed on the situation, I was hoping you'd help us keep a lookout. If I take Bonnie back to the guards with me, there's no way Pierre will try and come for her. Not even the most daring of criminals would attempt something like that. I have to admit, I'm not holding out too much hope that Pierre will come back for her. But if there's even the slightest chance, then it's worth a shot. Well, I've got some other leads to follow up on. If PR does appear, please contact me right away. It's nothing. I'm fine. It's just... The head of the Lefebvre family. He was the eminent person who kidnapped me all those years ago. It was at a dinner party. Someone tricked me into boarding the Lefebvre family carriage. Whoever it was, they took me back to their home. But before anything worse could happen, Father intervened. Yep. Father was the one who orchestrated the fall of the Lefebvre family. That's what led Lenny and I to join the House of the Hearth. After all these years. I never thought I'd hear the Lefevera name again. Don't worry about me. I wasn't feeling sorry for myself. I was just thinking about Lenny. He's been acting strange recently. He avoids me for days on end, consumes himself with some secret investigation, and then out of the blue pushes me to do that acting job. Thinking about it now... It's almost like the one I drew from that deck of cards was part of his plan all along. He must have asked Fermine to help him out. In any case, I know he's hiding something from me. He's really pulled out all the stops this time. It's very possible. I'm sure he tried to send me away because he was afraid it would bring up some painful memories for me. It wasn't necessary, though. Even after all these years, he's still as overprotective as ever. You'll have to help me teach him a lesson if we run into him along the way. 
Yep. I want to head to the Fontaine Research Institute to learn more information about Pierre. Just let me activate search mode, and then we'll head out. Who knows? Maybe we'll run into Linny along the way. A little bit of both, perhaps. For the most part, though, I just have the sense that something's not right. Something isn't adding up about Pierre's story. I'm just not sure what. Okay, I'll write a letter explaining everything to the crew. Once that's done, we can head out. Lynette, you're, uh, not at rehearsal? You can drop the act, brother. In fact, I don't think either of us will have a need for acting anytime soon. You should know better than to try and keep something from me. You've never been able to do that, even when we were kids. <sighs> and that's why I tried to distract you with the masked mime show. But I guess you're just too good. Care to introduce us to your new assistant? <clears throat> this is Officer Shavras, Captain of the Special Security and Surveillance Patrol. You may have met her already. Nice to see you. I should clarify something. Mr. Lenny's here at my invitation, not the other way around. To borrow your expression, Miss Lynette, I suppose that would make him my assistant more than anything. We've brought on Mr. Linney as a consultant in the past. He was instrumental in helping us crack a case involving a perpetrator who used magic tricks to commit crimes. I was hoping he'd be able to provide some valuable insight this time around as well. Ah, uh, so you've heard everything then? That's exactly why we're here. There's always been questions surrounding the fall of the Lefebvre family. Some people even believe the House of the Hearth was involved. Whoever was behind it all was extremely cautious. They didn't leave a shred of evidence. This very fact, however, leads me to believe it was indeed the work of that harbinger. I took a look at the entrance and exit records of all the carriages that night. Let's just say it wasn't hard to deduce that there's ill will between you two. Don't worry. I don't have any evidence to that effect, and I certainly don't plan on going to bat for such a despicable family. Plus, you were victims back then more than anything. I sought Mr. Linney's help with the smuggling case, nothing more. The way I look at it, it's a collaboration between us as people, not the organizations we represent. Besides, by working together, we can expose the truth as quickly as possible. You can hardly say that's at odds with the justice my organization strives for. Not at all. I was planning to invite you from the very beginning, Miss Lynette. It's just that my assistant here raised some objections. Um... Uh... Linny, I'm not the same person I was back then. That little girl who did nothing but cower in the corner in fear, she doesn't need saving anymore. Uh, I'm sorry, Lynette. You're right. I let my concerns get the better of me. Oh, and the next time you want to distract me, you should try a different approach. Who's this? You pick up a stray while I was gone? Uh, it's a bit complicated. I'll explain later. Anyway, her name's Bonnie. Well, if there are no objections, then I suppose the only thing left to say is... Lynette? Traveler? Welcome to the team. It appears the Lafayette family was very particular in their use of insignias and emblems. The family would use different emblems to mark differences in status, blood relation, and the like. In fact, the insignia that was discovered on the pendant was used to represent an illegitimate child. It's highly likely. That very status might have been what allowed him to emerge from the fall of his family relatively unscathed. It would also explain why he was able to assume a new identity as a researcher with relative ease. We discovered something interesting, though. After talking to some of his co-workers, it appears he pretty much works at the Institute in name only. He's practically been cast out. Apparently, Pierre was once addicted to synth. He tried to use the resources at the Institute to create a substance with a similar effect. He claimed it was just for research purposes, but the Institute revoked his access to the relevant materials regardless. 
he was placed on disciplinary leave pending a thorough investigation of his actions. But it seems the Institute ran into some trouble along the way. Could have been a lack of personnel or a timing issue. In any case, they had to table their formal investigation into Pierre. Unfortunately, that also included reporting any relevant information to the higher authorities. As for his family background, it appears none of his co-workers at the Institute were aware of that information. All they could tell us was that he was quite the recluse. Other than the pendant, we didn't find anything else of note at his residence in Poisson. Based on the samples of imitation synth we've been able to analyze, it appears the substance leaves behind strong traces wherever it's produced or stored. Those traces might not be obvious to the casual observer, but they're not something our guard poodles would miss. Pierre's home, though, came up completely clean. We didn't find any records indicating possible involvement in overseas transactions either. So, the Marachose Phantom didn't view him as a major suspect at first. Hmm. Maybe he had a separate, dedicated area where he made the imitation synth. Well, his neighbors did say he was often gone for long stretches of time. You would think with him out and about so much, people would have spotted him around Poisson, but residents said they barely ever saw him in town. If his reclusive nature was just a matter of keeping a low profile, I guess it would make sense for him to have a secret base to carry out his business. After he disappeared, the guards conducted a thorough search of Poisson, but they didn't come across any suspicious locations. Poisson? You know Hotel de Boer, where I first found Bonnie? To get there from Poisson, you have to cross a stretch of ocean. It's not somewhere a cat could just wander off on its own. A cat? You mean... Bonnie is Pierre's cat. Oh, that's right! When the Marachose Phantom first tracked him down, I remember there being something about a cat in their report. So this is her? From what we've learned about Pierre's habits, he doesn't seem like the type to venture out without a purpose. So what you're saying, Lynette, is that Bonnie couldn't have gone missing in Poisson. If that's true, then... Exactly. Bonnie might even know where it is. Wait, you think the cat can lead us there? But she's not trained like one of our guard poodles. How is she supposed to understand what we want her to do? Guess she's a little skittish around strangers. Meow. Meow, meow. Meow? Hmm. Near the coast, the beach, and beneath the cliffs. The place we're looking for is most likely north of the Court of Fontaine. Well, I've certainly never taken a witness statement like this before. <laughs> well, if it works out, maybe it's something worth getting used to. Cats and humans are actually pretty alike. When it comes to communication, most of what we want to convey can be accomplished through body language alone. But humans tend to rely too much on speech to ever take advantage of that fact. Of course, body language has its limitations. You're not going to be able to get across anything too complicated. The important thing is that we now have a lead. Let's try and find a place that matches the clues Bonnie gave us. Seems like Bonnie is trying to take us somewhere. Gardamex ahead! Look out! Into the wind! Echo and song! Who wants some of this? <laughs> Bam! <laughs> wow, Lynette. You found this place so easily. If I thought there was any chance you'd say yes, 
I'd recruit you into the Special Patrol here and now, no questions asked. <laughs> Sounds familiar. I pretty much receive letters daily from people trying to poach her from me. Let's just focus on our search. There's a lot to investigate. Aha! Just as we thought. This is where the imitation synth was being made. Looks like he's got more than just imitation synths stashed around here. In addition to the raw materials needed to synthesize the substance itself, there's a large quantity of cleaning agents and a few drugs I haven't been able to identify. These cleaning agents are likely used to dispel traces of the substance, like its smell. The Special Patrol did some digging into imitation synth. Our records indicate that it's very difficult for ordinary people to detect traces left behind by the stuff. I'm sure that was the case for Pierre as well. It must have taken a considerable amount of time and skill to ensure all those traces get washed away. But what are these other drugs for? The material these bags are made of, it's quite rare. It's the very same, actually. Romera Time Flower Fiber. But there's something special about the composition of these bags. I took a closer look, and it appears they're not only waterproof, but also corrosion and leak resistant. Even the strings look specially designed to keep the bags closed nice and tight. I came across some bags made of the same material just now, but they were much smaller and thinner. From the look of them, they seemed far less durable as well. Very similar, actually. Normally, it would be easy for a guard poodle to sniff out the imitation synth, but if it was sealed away in a bag like that, it might be possible to elude detection for some time. But what could these big bags be for, then? If the goal is to keep the imitation synth hidden and sealed away, these bags seem a bit too conspicuous. When the Mar Chaussee Phantom searched Pierre's house, there was no sign of these barrels, right? Hmm. You're right. That doesn't seem like his way of doing things. How did he get them here, then? Only the lower halves of the barrels appear to have been submerged in water. Based on the various ingredients we've found, this appears to be where Pierre was cooking up his imitation synth. It looks like he used a special cleaning agent to get rid of any residual traces of the substance on his person before he left. That's how he was able to get past the guard poodles. So then he transferred the imitation synth into small sealed bags and took it somewhere else for the drop-off. No. I don't believe our suspect is the kind of person who'd go around carrying incriminating evidence with him. That would potentially create too many eyewitnesses. The cleaning agent and the sealed bags might get past the guard poodles, but if a member of the public or even a guard on patrol happened to see him during the drop-off, a quick search would reveal everything. That's still a very risky operation. The barrels we found were wet around the base, but the top half was dry as if they'd been standing upright in the water. Hmm. If you put a barrel in the water, it will normally float on its side, unless it's heavily loaded, in which case it'll sink. Yes. With flotation rings around the body of the barrels, they'd stay upright in the water, and then he could afford to load them more fully. You think he used floating barrels? Hmm. I suppose if he acted at night, when there are very few other boats around and visibility is low, it's a valid theory. We can't rule it out. But then, wouldn't the barrels be carried off by the waves or the currents? How would the person doing the pickup know where to look? Traveler, can you come take a dip in the sea with me? I have a feeling that somewhere down there, we might find some rope. If a rope can be used to keep a pet from running away, then why not a barrel?
the wreckage of a small boat? This isn't the place. This isn't the place. Got it. Time to go up and report. As expected, we found a few pieces of rope and some anchoring stones underwater. If you attach them to a floating barrel, it would look like this. With this anchoring system, it would be possible to use floating barrels for the drop-off. You would just need to drop them in the water at the agreed-upon location. We also came across the wreckage of a small boat. It must have been left out on the water and capsized due to the force of the wind and waves. Its small size, however, would have made it perfect for staying undetected. Let's talk this through. Based on the evidence we've collected, it seems like Pierre would row a small boat out to the agreed upon transfer point, drop off the barrels, leave, and then row back and retrieve them after the transfer was complete. It could be that he was trying to avoid meeting up with his associate face to face. As one of the sole survivors of the Lafayette family, maybe he was just used to that sort of elusive lifestyle. It seems like Pierre deliberately chose the floating barrel method so that the goods could be dropped off and picked up at separate times. That way, the two parties wouldn't have to meet each other. Well, if that's the case, they must not have a very close working relationship. Let's not jump to any conclusions just yet. Assumptions can be detrimental to solving a case. It's possible they were just trying to keep a low profile. Two boats sailing to the same location at once could be too conspicuous. The most important thing is that we can now confirm Pierre wasn't acting alone. The floating barrel drop-off system is proof enough of that. Let's say for now that he was only in charge of producing the imitation synth. That would mean there has to be at least one other person involved in the operation likely in charge of transporting the goods across the border. Since we've determined that the goods were transported by boat, maybe we can track down some travel logs or something. We can certainly check the various ports for that information. It's possible, however, that Pierre's associate also used a small boat for the transport and docked along the shore rather than at a large port. If that's the case, it's unlikely there would be any record left behind. Absolutely. Before Pierre disappeared, we made sure to investigate all sorts of outward-bound vessels. We also had port authorities keep a lookout for anything suspicious. Unfortunately, we were never able to find out how they managed to get the imitation synth across the border. You're right. Whatever vessel was used for the pickup, the person responsible for smuggling the substance out of Fontaine would have had to use a larger vessel for the actual transport. That's the only way they would be able to smuggle on a large enough scale to make a profit. They must have found a way to disguise the imitation synth to clear port inspections. Exactly. We can't let any opportunities slip through the cracks. Although, given the amount of ports that could be involved, we should probably split up. I'll run home and ask some of my brothers and sisters to try and dig up some information. I should also head back and update my platoon on our progress. I'll grab some reinforcements while I'm at it. Lynette, Traveler, why don't you head to Lumidus Harbor and see what you can find out? All right. Come on, Bonnie. You too. Oh, Lynette, Traveler. And Bonnie too. What brings you all here? Hmm? Did something happen? Oh, I see. Thank you for everything you're doing for the people of Fontaine. I'm in charge of guarding the port. You mentioned you were after some travel logs, right? I can go fetch those for you. Looks like I've got another hard day of work ahead of me. <sighs> no, not usually. It's this incident that happened recently. Before that, 
everything was normal. All we had to do was confiscate anything suspicious and we could call it a day. Pretty simple stuff. But things are much more complicated now. We somehow let suspicious cargo pass through the port undetected. Not even our guard poodles were able to sniff it out. Even worse, we still don't know how the perpetrator was able to conceal the goods so well. By suspicious cargo, do you mean imitation synth? Yep. However, prohibited substances are just one example. We confiscate all sorts of contraband during the course of our inspections. Or at least, we're supposed to. So what happens to the goods you confiscate? Oh, we keep them in a storage locker. If they turn out to be something particularly dubious, we'll turn them over to the Maison Ordelie. If the goods are only slightly suspicious but could otherwise be harmless, like raw materials that could potentially be used to create contraband, we return them to the ship they were confiscated from instead of letting them pass through the port. Sorry for the wait. These are the travel logs for all the recent activity at the port. Oh, you brought Gerard with you. Uh, actually, he followed me here himself. It's like he smells something on me. Huh. I wonder why Gerard is reacting to you two so strongly. Huh? We were so careful not to touch it, but we still ended up with traces on us. If it leaves a residue so easily, I just don't understand how the culprit was able to disguise the goods at all. Why don't you have a look at the travel logs first? All ships coming in and out of the port are recorded here, except for the ones the port authorities ride to and from work. The Humane Society. Their name is all over the exit logs. The purpose for leaving is always listed as overseas adoption. Ah, the director of the organization explained that, actually. He said a lot of the cat and dog breeds unique to Fontaine are also very popular overseas. So, his organization offers an overseas adoption program. Bernard, the director of the Humane Society, was the man who came looking for Bonnie earlier. Have you figured it out too, Traveler? The way the criminal disguised the goods? When Bernard asked to take a closer look at Bonnie, he was actually checking whether there was any imitation synth in her stomach. Uh, wait, what? The sealed bags we found at the secret base. They were specially made to be corrosion resistant. And there were gaps around the lids of the barrels, and airbags were used to keep them upright in the water. Those drug chevres found at the secret base. She most likely didn't recognize them because they're not used on human beings. It's an anesthetic used on pets. The perpetrator must have given it to the animals. Pure. Must have made the animals swallow the sealed bags full of imitation synth at a secret base. Then he stuffed them into floating barrels and left the rest to Bernard. The sealed bags combined with an animal's body odor would certainly be enough to mask the scent of imitation synth. During our inspections, we would have never thought to inspect the bellies of those animals for anything suspicious. Even if we tried to feel around for something, I'm sure it would be difficult to detect. Exactly. I bet Bernard even transported animals with synth in their stomach alongside ones without. That way, it would be even harder to say with certainty that something was amiss. Mm. She's probably in the clear. Otherwise, Bernard would have never left without her. I'm guessing he didn't know whether Pierre had already hidden the next batch of imitation synth before he fled. Just imagine. He sees the notice we put in the Steambird, and it turns out that one of the very cats he gave to Pierre for the smuggling operation is out in the open, roaming the streets of Fontaine. If Pierre had already hidden the next batch of imitation synth, then Bonnie would practically be living proof of their crimes. He would have had no choice but to go after her. So, that's why he came to find you and insisted on taking a closer look at the cat. Ah, uh, 
Wait a second, I'm a little lost here. I get the part about hiding the substance in the pets, but those... Uh, what did you call them again? Floating barrels? Why even put the animals in there in the first place? If you've got something as convenient as a floating barrel, why not just stuff it with the imitation synth directly? Why not wait to hide the stuff until after the exchange has been made? In order to make sure the animals could swallow the sealed bags, they made them extremely thin. Had they not done that, the animals would have likely bitten or chewed through them. That step would have required a lot of energy, as well as a certain amount of technical expertise. So, it was better left to the more experienced Pierre. We've already proven how easy it is to pick up trace amounts of imitation synth, so I'm sure Bernard was taking all the precautions he could to avoid the same fate. Okay. Then, let's head to the Humane Society right away and bring that guy to justice. I'll bring a Gardamek to speed up the process. The headquarters of the Humane Society should be somewhere around here. Bernard could show up any moment now. Ah, oh, here are the people from earlier. Wait, you're from... the guards? After him! We can't let him get away! Give it up, Bernard. Mercy, have mercy. I'll talk, I'll tell you everything I know. The Humane Society has done so much good over the years, and yet you have committed such an atrocious deed in its name. Look, I didn't have a choice, okay? My father cared about those blasted animals so much, he didn't bother to take care of his human wife and son at all. While those animals were showered with love, I lived worse than a dog. No one asked. Tell me, how did you first get to know Pierre? Well, after I took over the Humane Society, it gradually became harder and harder to maintain its operations. Until one day, someone suddenly passed me a letter. It said that I could stand to get a large sum of money as long as I helped them to transport some animals abroad. It was only after a few such transports that I finally understood what I was really transporting. But then, Pierre wrote to me, saying that we were already partners in crime and that I better keep cooperating with him if I didn't want to be reported to the guards. You knew it from the very beginning, didn't you? The reason why you had to go through so many steps just to transport some animals. I'd suggest that you confess everything right now if you don't want to add anything else to your list of crimes. <laughs> yes, officer! I would order wooden barrels and flotation devices according to his instructions, and then load the sleeping animals onto a boat. Once I sailed to the location he provided, I would dump everything together into the sea. And a few days after that, I'd come by again in my boat and pick up the animals sleeping in the barrels. Once I had received enough of them, I'd bring them to the harbor to be adopted abroad. That guy, Pierre, he was running the entire show. He set up all the meeting times and found all the foreign adopters. Oh, oh and he even supplied all of the goods, too. I just did the transport. He was the one who planned out and executed everything else. Look, I don't know, okay? I've never ever met him in person. We've only ever communicated through letters. And when did he send his final letter to you? J just last night. He said that the Marshalsea Phantom is now after him, so he's planning to go into hiding for some time. He didn't mention where he's thinking about going, though. B but he did tell me to look out for the guards. It's been a few days since Pierre's last appearance. I'd wager that he sent that letter after he found his hiding spot. I... I burned them. It was on his orders. I had to burn every letter after reading them. I, I wasn't even allowed to share them with the rest of the society employees. Sure sounds like you're trying to use the lack of witnesses or evidence to pin the blame on Pierre. No, no I swear, this time I'm only telling you the truth. Well, we can check the truth of your statements at the Opera House. I hope you know what'll be coming for you if I were to find any discrepancy between the evidence and the testimony you just gave. I know, I know, I swear I was just telling the truth. <sighs> My thanks to you both. Had it not been for you, 
I really don't know what would have happened to this case. Bonnie helped, too. <laughs> That's true. It was all thanks to her that Bernard was finally exposed. <laughs> and it looks like she's grown quite fond of you two as well. <sighs> then I'll leave you be. Just let me know if you find any other new leads. that obvious, huh? Well, even though it didn't feel like Bernard was lying, after talking to him, I'm getting an even stronger sense that something's not quite right. We investigated so quickly that perhaps we've missed a thing or two along the way. Let me activate deduction mode and consider things again from the top to see if we can find anything new. Is there still anything unresolved or strange that we should try to consider? Well, we've discovered that Bernard is responsible for the trafficking, while Pierre deals with supplying the goods. Is there something else in this scheme that we're missing? There's no need to rush. Let's see if we can find any other suspicious points about this case. The Marachaussee Phantom found Bonnie and the Lefebvre pendant at Pierre's residence. That was the beginning point of our investigation. Why would he leave such an obvious trail for us to follow, when he took so much care to not leave any traces of imitation synth in his home? Bernard claims to have received a letter last night from Pierre. In the letter, Pierre stated that he had gone into hiding. Is there something wrong with the letter? There's no need to rush. Let's see if we can find any other suspicious points about this case. Now behave, and follow me to the interrogation room. Ow, that hurt. Ow! Is everything really over? I still feel like the relationship between Pierre and Bernard is not as simple as it appears. Also, I've had this strange sense that something's off the entire time we've been on the case, and it has only gotten worse. Mm. No good. I've still got nothing, and I'm nearly out of energy. All right, I'll stop thinking about it, for now. At the very least, we've made it so that no more animals will suffer like those poor animals did. And that's what I hope. Let's go to the Humane Society, and see if there are any animals left that might still need our help. Before my energy for today completely runs out. Hmm. Huh, it would 
We investigated. Is there still any? Well, we've. According to Bernard, Pierre also supplied all of the goods. But if the Marchose Phantom's records are correct, Pierre should have lost all access to the materials required to create the imitation synth. And the Institute has also not reported any theft of their stocks. The Marchose Phantom found Bonnie and the Lefever pendant at Pierre's residence. That was the beginning point of our investigation. Why would he leave such an obvious trail for us to follow, when he took so much care to not leave any traces of imitation synth in his home? Bernard claims to have received a letter last night from Pierre. In the letter, Pierre stated that he had gone into hiding. Is there something wrong with the letter? If Bonnie had imitation synth in her body, then she was a liability that had to be recovered at all costs. But if she wasn't carrying anything, then it would have made sense to tell Bernard not to worry. And thinking about it, Bernard only attracted our attention in the first place because he came to look for Bonnie. Could it be that the person who wrote the letter also knew nothing about Bonnie's whereabouts? Or they had a separate goal entirely? The final question is, why did I sense that something wasn't right after hearing Bernard's testimony? Even more so than before. Deductive mode deactivated. <sighs> I think we may be close to the actual answer. Now behave and follow me to the interrogation room. Ow, that hurt. Ow! Is there something else you need from me, Traveler? Huh? I see. It all makes sense now. Hey, what are you talking about? <laughs> Look, even our confessed criminal here has no idea what you're saying. Because he has been kept in the dark all along. And I assume it's the same with Pierre. <sighs> That never quite added up for me. Why did Pierre feel compelled to return to his home with Bonnie and the Pendant and make them so easy to find for the Marchose Phantom? Both of 
these things are in stark contrast to his usual meticulous and vigilant behavior. There's only one reasonable explanation. He was following orders, just like Bernard. He probably received the following instructions right before the Phantom came knocking on his door. Bring the cat and the pendant, and our undercover agent will be sure to help you. Unbeknownst to him, however, the third person who wrote that letter to him had long decided to sacrifice him and Bernard to save themselves. What? You can't be serious. There was a third person involved? If you focus only on Bernard's testimony, it's easy to believe that only Bernard and Pierre were working together. The case appeared extremely simple. Bernard did the trafficking, Pierre the imitation synth production, drugging, and stuffing. W wait but that doesn't make any sense. If that's the actual truth, then as soon as Pierre is caught, you explain his side of the story and the third person will... Yep, which is why the third person made sure that Pierre would never be found again. Once they had instructed Pierre to expose himself, the third person wrote to Pierre again, suggesting that everything had been taken care of, and he should take Bonnie and safely return to his base. Of course, Pierre's disappearance at such a sensitive time immediately made him a prime suspect. Knowing that Bonnie had last been seen with him, all the third person would have to do from that point on would be to lead the Phantom to investigate the Humane Society and get Bernard to confess the truth. Wait, so you're saying that the letter I received yesterday, the one that made me think Pierre was still alive, it was also sent by the third person? Is... is that what happened? <laughs> I'll get back to headquarters right away and reinvestigate this case from the top. Chevra said that assumptions can be detrimental to solving a case. Someone among us, however, has been feeding us all kinds of preconceived notions ever since our first meeting. They suggested that Pierre's disappearance was an attempt to escape the judgment of the law, and that Pierre was a scion of the Lefever family. But if the disappearance is truly just a cover-up for a murder, then couldn't the true sign have been an illegitimate daughter rather than an illegitimate son? Huh? <laughs> Haven't you taken this joke a bit too far? You're right. I did let a lot of assumptions get to my head when I first started to talk to you about the case. I'll make sure to correct my behavior. You deliberately fed us lies, but even you could not control every last detail of your plan. There was a flaw in your scheme, and something didn't quite go as planned. Getting the Mar Chose Phantom to notice Pierre was only the first part of your plan. Had they failed to take notice of the Humane Society, they could have cast a wider net. And you couldn't predict what they might possibly find, if given enough time. This, of course, was the main weakness of your plan. As someone accustomed to acting from behind the scenes, you didn't want to take the risk of personally proposing a raid on the Humane Society. So, you thought about pulling a few more strings, so all the suspicion would point towards Bernard and his society. Once the Phantom expanded their search, it would only be a matter of time before they found Pierre's base. If a cat last seen with a suspect turned up dead at the imitation synth base, it wouldn't be long until the Phantom would figure out exactly how she had been mistreated and turn their eyes towards the one organization that has been sending boatloads of animals out of Fontaine. It was probably during your ambush of Pierre. You didn't even have the time to check if she had already been stuffed full of imitation synth. <laughs> Still, you soon found another opportunity. Before long, Bonnie had made her way back into the city, and even popped up on the steam bird. Like Bernard, you desperately wanted to confirm the contents of her stomach, so you hurried to find us. Unlike Bernard, however, you were hoping that Pierre did have the time to make her swallow a load of imitation synth. While investigating the suspect's cat, we unexpectedly discovered that the suspect has been smuggling imitation synth using living animals as intermediaries. 
That was your plan, in any case. With that, you'd have been able to lead the investigation towards the Humane Society. Bonnie had managed to escape before Pierre was able to stuff her full of imitation synth. That part of your plan could no longer be carried out. But as shrewd as you were, you came up with another plan right away. You manipulated the Traveler and I to help you identify Bernard as a key suspect. You used the Lefebvre name as bait to get us to join your investigation. With two extra bodies around, the Special Patrol is sure to soon take note of the strange event of Bernard somehow having a reason to look for Pierre's cat. <laughs> so, what you're saying is, I went to all that trouble just for the chance that you might put forth the suggestion that would lead you down the wrong path. Of course, you did far more than that. Just now at Lumidus Harbor, were you not the person who highlighted the suspicious activities of the society? Ugh. You even highlighted the society's activities during your compilation of the logs, so they'd be immediately visible to anyone examining the records. Moreover, the logs contained no records of the Port Authority's activities. In other words, your activities. And what are you trying to suggest with that? I am insinuating that you had plenty of opportunities to transfer the raw materials for imitation synth from the harbor to a boat, and then sail over to the meeting place full of floating barrels. And that's how neither the trafficker nor the manufacturer knew there was a third person who supplied the raw materials and surreptitiously operated between them. Pierre manufactured imitation synth using the raw materials you provided, stuffed the animals, and placed the animals back into the barrels. Having received the green light from you as Pierre, Bernard then retrieved his animals and shipped them out of Fontaine once he had received enough for a full batch. This is the truth behind your smuggling ring. I can't believe it. I never put two and two together. <laughs> You've sure got an extremely lively imagination. So what do you think she's going to say next? But do you have any evidence? Hmm? Mm-hmm. It appears that it's quite easy to predict what you'll think or say. Then if we apply that to this case, we can also think of a few places to look for incriminating evidence. You know very well that this case will not end until Pierre is found. So you will have him commit suicide out of fear and shame to end the investigation for good. That way, you can also pin the blame for the overseas smuggling activities, the theft of the harbor's confiscated raw materials, and even the Lefebvre name on him. After all, dead men tell no tales. But you still wanted to appear as if he had sent that last letter to Bernard, so you have to make sure he cannot be found until after Bernard has confessed to the authorities. To do that, you either will hide his body until you've found an appropriate time to set up a fake suicide scene, or you'll dump it someplace where it'll be hard to determine the exact time of death. Submerged in water, for instance. The location would ideally allow you to keep the body hidden for some time while also letting you keep an eye on it. There are only so many options to hide a person's time of death after all. As long as the Phantom investigates each of the possibilities in turn, they'll surely find Pierre's remains. Especially since, as the prime suspect who will now be taken into custody, you will no longer have the time to move him or set up a fake suicide scene to cover up the murder. How absurd. And on what grounds will you order my arrest? Don't think for a second that your spouse of nonsense will amount to any kind of real argument. After all, I'm... Elodie Lefebvre! As the captain of the Special Security and Surveillance Patrol, I hereby declare you as a suspect in the case. If you have any objections, you may raise them later during interrogation. That's right. We received a message from Lumidus Harbor that you were going to investigate the Humane Society. We didn't expect to run into you at such a critical moment. While at the harbor, we noticed something else extremely interesting. Apparently, you often used all kinds of excuses to swap your shifts. 
And if one were to match the times of your shifts to the activities of the Humane Society and those of certain foreign ships, they'd find them to be an exact match. That... that's just a coincidence. Yes, I'm sure you have already thought of a dozen different ways to explain away the suspicious activities, but as far as evidence goes, that should be enough to warrant taking you into custody. Don't worry. If it turns out that the guards are still unable to find any evidence after all this, Lynette and I will do everything in our power to clear your name. <laughs> Although judging by her reaction, I assume no follow-up from us will be needed. <clears throat> the Lefevers were infamous for using disguise and infiltration to achieve their goals. Who would have thought that they would have planted someone within the guards? Judging from the timeline, they likely arranged for you to enter the guards before the fall of the clan. But they probably didn't expect you to turn it to your advantage and use your job to save yourself during the purge. Not only that, but you actively participated in the interrogation, arrest, and judgment of the Lefevers during their fall, thus clearing yourself of suspicion. You brutally and cruelly abandoned your allies as soon as they outlived their usefulness. Just like a lizard cutting off its own tail in order to live. You've been doing this for years. So... So you played me like a fool after all! <laughs> <laughs> what was that word you used? Ally? You think that someone as foolish as him is worthy to call himself my ally? They were worthless scum, all of them. Not just Bernard and Pierre, but those Lefevers too. They always just saw me as a tool. I lost all my chances of a normal life just because I was born into their lot. Not only that, but because they wanted me to become an undercover agent, they stripped me of my name too. I had to live in constant fear of them while they were alive. And even once they were gone, I had to continue to bury my heritage in my name. Always worrying that their enemies would come knocking at the door. Do you know anything about what I've been through over all these years? My life as the last Lefebvre? I don't, and neither do I care. Hark. Are you... Are you for real? Aren't you a Lefebvre victim too? Elodie, you're the only one still living under the shadow of a name. That's enough. Keep your hands where I can see them and do not resist arrest. If you have more to say, save it for the interrogation room. What a joke. <laughs> what a joke! <laughs> hey! Don't come any closer! What's that? Know what this is? <laughs> I've secretly planted loads of explosives in the Humane Society. Just one step closer and... Whether they're cats, dogs, or just unlucky human employees... They'll all be blown up into smithereens. <laughs> Surely you bunch of goody-two-shoes won't let that happen, right? That's enough! I have nothing left to say to any of you! Gardamex, get him! Not good. She's trying to escape. We need to end this fight as soon as possible! Windstrider! Order guide you! Attaboy! Busted so quickly, huh? Good thing I've already bought enough time to escape! Phew. So I was right after all. It's easier to deal with the person causing the problem than the problem itself. This is it. Looks like it's just a toy. Guess that's probably why she suddenly flipped and knocked out Bernard. He probably knew that there were no explosives at the society. 
Well, given that she never even showed her face to Bernard and Pierre, I had my doubts that she'd have gone to the society in person to plant explosives. Thank you for your help, everyone. I'll take them back for thorough questioning, and find someone better to take over the Humane Society. I might need a few statements from everybody. Would you be able to come with me? Uh, if statements are all you need, can Lenny provide them on my behalf? I still need to go back and explain some things to the crew. I also had an appointment with the Traveler before we got interrupted. So you do remember. Yes, I invited you to come over to our place. Once I'm done talking with the troop, I'll make a nice cup of tea and bring Bonnie to wait for you outside of my door. You must have spent a record-breaking amount of time in serious mode today. I can't remember the last time I've seen you like this. Is it because of a special someone? Hmm. Based on information that we found before, Imitation Synth was first circulated on a small scale in Fontaine before becoming a large-scale smuggling scheme. I'd assume that the first offerings of Imitation Synth came from what Pierre made in his early days. But since he was not experienced with running a clandestine operation, he was soon discovered by guard Elodie. Elodie saw the opportunity to make a great profit in his work, and perhaps even the chance of making a new life for herself, so she decided to cover his tracks. She started writing to him in Bernard's name, using what evidence she had compiled and the promise of enormous profits to blackmail him into cooperating with her. Unfortunately for her, she ran into Lynette. Even though my sister doesn't like to focus too much on a regular day, serious mode Lynette is one of the most perceptive people I've ever known. Still, all of that thinking really saps her energy. I need to go give some statements on her behalf, so I'll leave the recharging to you. You can leave the rest of this to me. The other guards will be joining me shortly. Don't worry, they won't have another chance to escape. Hmm. The materials have many other regular uses outside of being used to make imitation synth, so they're not immediately subject to being confiscated or destroyed. The harbor would usually just seize them for some time while the customs paperwork is filled out and approved. If approved, they'd be let through, and if not, they'd be returned to sender. Elodie probably used her position to replace a portion of the shipment with something else before sending the whole shipment back to sender. Given that the foreign merchants who sent in the shipments were probably working with her in the first place, they likely just never reported the difference in what they sent and what they received. We will, of course, continue to investigate the rest of the details of this case. Now that we've caught Elodie, figuring out the whole scheme should just be a matter of time. Hmm... Black tea and a cute kitty. Truly the best combo for standby mode. Want some? Mm-hmm. I hope you'll like it. Not at all. Information is indeed very important, but if you were to try to collect every piece of information you come across, your efficiency would actually decrease. Plus, if you just think about it, what sounds more fun? Writing a statement or enjoying a tea party? Great answer. That'd be my pick, too. Had we not run into that case, we could have spent the entire day like this. <sighs> but now, I'm running low on both time and energy. You're right. I can sense it. I'm recharging very quickly at the moment. Hmm, something about her rubbed me the wrong way since the very beginning. But to be more precise, it was probably around the time when I saw Bonnie try to get away from her. Elodie tried to get close, but Bonnie deliberately dodged her. Maybe Bonnie had tried to evade her before at Pierre's base. Or perhaps Bonnie just instinctively knew that she wasn't a good person. Not everyone who likes cats is a good person. But if cats like you, you're probably alright. 
Humans tend to overthink things, but cats rely on their instincts, and they're pretty sharp. I mean, just look at Bonnie. She took a liking to you the moment you met. A word of advice. Huh, I didn't like Clearly, there's some design flaws to Let's see which go for. Well, if you want to get the right show to put it another way, um, or why don't you pick a card? Since I ran into you here, that means. Uh, oh, thank you. This one is final, I promise. Here, take the fatometer. If it's five or above, that means fate successfully changed. Anything lower than five is a fail. Also, if you have your own thoughts about what I should do, feel free to share it. Now that I've got a good. <sighs> Back to the drinks reception. Nope, I said it was your decision. I'm not gonna waste any more energy dragging my feet. Besides, the drinks reception is technically part of the job as an official publicity event. So, if I bail on it, I might get sued for breach of contract, and that would be a huge pain in the butt. Oh, one other thing. Do you want to come with me? If you're free, I mean. Mm-hmm. Thanks. There you are, Lynette! Where did you disappear to? Leone and I have been looking everywhere for you. Wait, where did you get the cat? I found her outside. Do either of you happen to recognize her? Um, I don't think so. Could belong to one of the guests, I suppose. <sighs> Fair enough. That was a long shot. So sorry we couldn't help you, Lynette. Uh, don't worry. We'll ask around for you. Leone's probably just being forgetful. Maybe you can leave her with us. We'll take her to the reception desk and see if they know anything. And if not, we'll just keep looking. Sure. I would help, but I'm a little preoccupied. Sorry to dump this on you. It's no trouble at all. We're happy to help however we can. Also, uh, if it's no trouble, I mean, could we maybe get an autograph? And maybe a photo, too? Uh... uh Leone! You can't spring that on her now. Not while she's working. At least wait until the event's finished. One last thing, Lynette. Director Mary is looking for you. We'll take the cat to the front desk now. See you later. <sighs> I'm not usually required at these kinds of events, so I don't even have an event mode. All right, guess I'd better go see the director. Spectacular choreography, a masterpiece of mise-en-scene, and the performance, oh my, groundbreaking, dripping with uh, je ne sais quoi. My congratulations on another magnificent show, sir. Yes, yes, I for one was particularly captivated by the clearly allegorical narrative undertones. The lost puppet shines a spotlight on the impact of technological advances in our modern society, particularly as they relate to changing modes of emotional expression and the challenge of mutual intelligibility. Such a pioneering work, so far ahead of its time, a tour de force of avant-garde theater, <laughs> I can already see the headlines of tomorrow's newspapers. They will certainly be singing your praise, Director Maryu. <laughs> but it was a group effort, of course. To convey emotions in a silent show with no facial expressions, the entire cast had to go above and beyond. Everyone truly outdid themselves. Uh, speaking of the cast, Jillian, another strong performance from you in Director Mary Yu's latest show, as of course we've all come to expect from your numerous successful collaborations to date. That's quite an overstatement. I've only ever played supporting roles. 
On that point, you stated a few months ago in an interview that you were looking to secure a leading role in your next show. What led you to the decision to stay in a supporting role this time around? Um... <clears throat> we had a discussion about this, and while Lynette hadn't previously performed in an acting role, we were blown away by her talent, and she was a perfect fit for this character. Quite simply, this was the role she was born to play. Exactly. I was honored to share the stage with her. Lynette worked extremely hard in all of the rehearsals, and she's an incredibly talented actress. Oh, Lynette's back! Hey, Lynette, where have you been? Are you in standby mode? Some reports say you switched that state to recharge after a show. Ah, oh, method acting, of course. Such a compelling portrayal of a mechanical puppet could only be achieved by an actor who lives and breathes their role even while off stage. Those seemingly stilted movements were in fact an inspired portrayal of the character. The ostensibly bad acting, in reality, was the product of supreme acting skill. Oh, uh, I went outside and there was this cat there, so I played with the cat for a bit. A cat? <laughs> We've long heard that you are a kind soul, as well as an incredible actress. No wonder your debut performance has garnered such popularity. This show looks on track to break box office records for avant-garde theater. Lynette, any words for the fans? Um, not really, no. Uh, I believe Lynette is trying to say that the act of performance itself is the actor's true means of connecting with their fans. Oh, I see. Lynette, any comments? <sighs> mm-hmm. Right, exactly. But don't you want the fans to know how you're feeling right now? After the hugely successful opening of your first ever show? That's true. I'm sure the fans would love to learn a bit more about you, too. How interesting. Oh, really? I'm so sorry. How rude of me. Huh? Wait, you're... you're the traveler who's been in the news! Did you come to see the show? Wow, are you a fan of Lynette too? Do you have any comments on her first performance? <laughs> yeah, it's just... Turns out, even with you here to share the load, I can't cope with this stuff, even in tea party mode. Hmm. It's a power saving mode for participating in conversation at tea parties. Normally, I can get through an entire conversation just with. Mm hmm. Oh, that's true. And how interesting. But, at a tea party, I'm not normally subjected to a constant stream of questions. <sighs> the energy consumption of that interview just now was three times as much as the average tea party. Mm, I think I'd rather pray that I never have to do it again. Lynette? Director Maryu would like you to join the group photo to commemorate the successful opening of the show. A group photo? It's just the members of the troupe, along with Maloney and Corentin. Everyone's waiting for you. <sighs> All right, then. See you in a minute. Three, two, one, smile. My thanks to each and every one of you here for your help in making The Lost Puppet a success. The group photo is already being printed as I speak. You can collect your copy from the first floor after the drinks reception concludes. May it serve as a reminder of this fabulous performance every time you see it. Mary, you! <laughs> Get over here. Let's have another drink. There's a few things I need you to glance over for me. I thought the group photo was the final hurdle. 
Well, at least there's no more people hounding me with questions. I just need to find somewhere to switch to standby mode, and the time will fly by. I hope. Hotel de Boer's Ile Flutante is as wonderfully sweet as ever. Traveler? Lynette? Oh, wait, hold on. What do you mean, manage to get an invite? <laughs> I'm an expert in the dramatic arts. Of course I was invited. Naturally, people wanted to hear my comments on the emerging art form that is the Masked Mime Show. Remarkable, and a very worthwhile artistic endeavor. Exploring a character with no lines or facial expressions, who can only communicate how they feel through their movement. Your performance was beyond anything I could have imagined, Lynette. Clearly, this was a very suitable role for you indeed. Huh. Hmm? Is... is something wrong? No, it's nothing. Please go on. Oh, basically, I think I'd give it a positive review overall. Just not as gushing as the crowd downstairs. So, you thought they were pretty over the top, too? Hmm, in fairness, it's normal to bring along some vocal supporters for publicity when a new show opens. But still, this was something else. Then again, I'm no specialist in avant-garde theater. Uh, maybe I'm just not well acquainted with their review criteria. Or maybe it's because I came to the show with some preconceived expectations. I did happen to see the original draft of Mary U's script a while back. What original draft? Oh? He didn't show it to you? It must have been a few months ago. He came to me to get some advice from an experienced performer's perspective, and then asked if I could write a few reviews of his new play. I had a lot on my plate at the time, so I had to turn him down. I only skimmed a few sections, but they seemed quite different from the final version. I can't say I remember the plot, but... I don't know. The protagonist just seemed more... complex, I guess? Especially in the last two scenes. Still a mechanical puppet on the outside, of course, but she seemed to have more emotional depth on the inside. Emotional depth? Oh, <laughs> I'm just thinking aloud here. Don't take it to heart. Besides, a script and a play are two very different beasts. There are so many fine details to consider when turning a story into a stage production. More than most people could imagine. Especially with a novel art form like a masked mime show. I'm sure Mary Yu had his reasons for the changes he made. Hmm. <clears throat> Change of topic. I see you've escaped the crowds to seek refuge on the second floor. Fame can be overwhelming at first, can't it? Uh, perhaps you'd benefit from hearing about the experiences of a veteran celebrity such as myself. No thanks, I'm good. Pretty sure this will be my first and last time in this situation. Uh, hey, at least let me finish. I have top tips on dealing with belligerent reporters, slipping away to hunt down snacks during the intermission. Hmm. Tell me everything. <laughs> first, take a seat, mon ami. We must partake of Hotel de Boer's fine desserts as we talk, lest they go to waste. Hmm, that was very educational. I expect most of the people downstairs have left by now. Time to grab my copy of the group photo and get home. The photo must be in this envelope right here. Ah, <sighs> it's finally over. Thank you for sticking around for so long. 
If it wasn't for you, I don't know how I would have standby moded my way through the last few hours. <clears throat> it's fine. It's just... It was such a minor thing. While I was on stage, there was a moment when I felt like someone was looking at me. It was only for an instant, and I didn't even see who it was. But somehow, I knew it was a look of contempt. I got a vague sense of it again during the reception. Like someone was giving me an evil stare. But I couldn't figure out who it was. Normally, I'm used to lurking in the shadows on the stage and spying on other people. So, it was strange, feeling like I was the one being spied on this time. Or, someone just took a disliking to me for no real reason. Sometimes, you can like one person and dislike another for equally pointless reasons. Anyway, it was just a momentary stink eye, that's all. Nothing for you to worry about. Okay, problem solved. I'm gonna take this envelope and go home now. <laughs> you have destroyed this work of art. Step down from the leading role at once. Based on the tone, I'd say Threat Letter is right. I don't think we're gonna find any more clues here. Yes, let's. Whatever destroyed means, it could have something to do with the original script that Farina mentioned. Also, I'm gonna have to ask you to stick around a while longer. Ah, I can't believe how well the whole Lynette's debut acting role thing worked out. Even the avant-garde box office is laughing it up. <laughs> How could I ever have doubted you? If you hadn't stuck to your guns and kept sending those invitations, this opportunity would have passed us by. See? I told you. All the times she'd refused in the past were all the more reason to keep inviting her, because it turns into a big talking point. Can you imagine if you'd gone with Jillian? You'd have been lucky to get half the ticket sales you've ended up with. True. Well, Jillian still needs to get a few more productions under her belt. Do you have a moment, Director Mario? Uh, oh! Ah, if it isn't the star of the show! Uh, we were just talking about you! Hmm? Oh, and is that the legendary traveler with you? I'm guessing you're here to discuss the show with the director? <laughs> oh, you're a talented and hardworking actress, Lynette. It's no wonder you're getting such rave reviews! I'll leave you artists to discuss your work in peace. Uh, Mary, you make sure you give your star performer and her friend your full attention. I certainly will. Lynette carries the fortunes of our entire troupe on her shoulders. <laughs> Mr. Maloney, an investor or something, I think. I've never asked him. <laughs> So, uh, what can I do for the two of you? I'm afraid I'll have to dash soon as I'm meeting some friends from the newspaper. Otherwise, I'd love to stay longer. 
We heard that the original script for The Lost Puppet was quite different from the final show. I'm kind of curious to know what the protagonist was like in that version. Oh! Well, this is a surprise. I didn't think you'd be interested in that sort of thing. It's not uncommon for scripts to undergo major changes as they're being brought to the stage. But I'm afraid there's not much to tell you in this case. The protagonist has stayed the same from the beginning to end. A mechanical puppet with a bumbling body but a sensitive soul. A stranger in time who doesn't belong. There's no doubt about it. You are the protagonist, and the protagonist is you. The success of one is the success of the other, and that's what made this show an artistic triumph. Mm. Sorry, you've lost me. Can you put it in plain words? <coughs> All right, then. Delving deep in the search of core truths is the job of an artist, after all. You shouldn't give your attention to early drafts of the script, Lynette. All it would do is sow confusion where you already have clarity. The current script is the final version because it is the best version, and your performance best brings that script to life. Why, if it weren't for you, I doubt any audience would give our show the time of day. What letter? Oh my goodness! Destroyed this work of art? Really? Well, Director Mario, any idea who might have written it? No. Who on earth would write such nonsense? Absolutely not. Without Lynette, this show would be over. Everyone's hard work would go to waste. No, there's no way that this is someone from the troupe. Yeah, maybe Jillian could fill in for me for a while. What? No way! Out of the question! The protagonist has to be played by Lynette. Jillian can't... She's just... not what the audience is looking for. Ah! I've got it! It's a competitor. Yes, this letter must be from a competitor of ours who's trying to get under Lynette's skin! You can't lie low. That's just what they want you to do. The moment you step back from performing, they'll put their rumor mill into overdrive and drag us through the mud. They're just waiting for their chance to kick us while we're down. A competitor? Really? Definitely. Those lowlifes. Slander and libel are all their specialties. They drown out the truth with a flood of misinformation, and they stop at nothing once they get riled up. Oh, there's so many of them out there. Fame always seems to attract haters, no matter what you do to try and keep everyone happy. But don't worry, I will get to the bottom of this. Stay strong, Lynette, and keep up the good work on stage. I have to go and meet my friends from the newspapers now, but rest assured, I'll be discussing countermeasures with them. So, a competitor, huh? Mm, I kinda doubt it. We've dealt with those types before. Usually their goal is to steal our venue for their own show, or to cover up a scandal by planting a story to divert public attention. But, at the moment, I don't think anyone's got a reason to do any of that stuff. Let alone pull a stunt like this. A threat letter is quite extreme. Besides, when I felt that evil stare, I'm pretty sure it was coming from somewhere backstage. So that rules out a lot of people. I'm actually more concerned about Mary you. When I mentioned Jillian, his reaction was pretty unusual. Especially since Maloney mentioned that the initial plan was to cast Jillian as the lead. Sounds like there was an original protagonist as well as an original script. 
Hmm. I should probably go talk to her. Yep. She told me she lives in the flow of Sandra. Let's be L Lynette? What are you doing? You're not welcome here. I've been to the flow of Sandra plenty of times before. And this is the first I'm hearing about me not being welcome. Things are different around here. You might be used to a crowd of bootlicking morons fawning over you wherever you go, but not down here. We... We know what you are. Bootlicking morons? I don't know. I've never met this kid before. Gina, stop that! Go home now! B Jillian! No but. How many times do I have to tell you? That had nothing to do with Lynette. If you don't leave right now, I swear I'll... I'll... I'll never invite you to one of my shows ever again! Jillian! I... I... <laughs> Just because Lady Farina speaks highly of you, it doesn't mean you're all that! I'm so sorry. Gina's always been a strong-willed child. That's why I never let her visit me at work. It's okay. I have younger siblings too, so I get it. She's in her rebellious phase, huh? If you let angsty kids get you riled up, they'll drain all your energy. So don't worry, I won't let it get to me. <sighs> well, the situation's a little different in this case, but still, thank you. So, what brings you to the flu of Sandra? We heard about it from Maloney. He said you were originally supposed to play the lead. Maloney, huh? Of course he couldn't keep his mouth shut. I'm sorry. I never mentioned it because Director Mary, you was very clear that I mustn't let any of it affect you. What's this? <gasps> I... I don't know, uh... Who would do something like this? Don't be scared, Jillian. Just tell us what you know. Okay. I'll try. It's true. I was originally cast as the lead in The Lost Puppet. I've worked with director Mary Yu many times before, but only in minor roles. The audiences and critics never had much to say about me. Nothing terrible, but nothing amazing either. A few months ago, Mary Yu started working on a new show, so I plucked up the courage to ask him if I could take the leading role. He was hesitant, but he agreed to let me try for the part. We did a few rehearsals, everything seemed to be going okay, but then... There's... been a change of plan, Jillian. The leading role will now be played by Lynette. Lynette? But she always turns these things down, doesn't she? And that's why we cannot afford to waste this opportunity. Chilean, I understand how you must be feeling. But Maloney and myself have to do what's best for the production as a whole. Next time, the lead will be yours. I promise. I was incredibly disappointed at first. But I also know full well that I don't have Lynette's star power. Without Lynette, how could we ever convince people to pay money to go and see a masked mime show? And if the show was a flop with me in the leading role, how would I answer to the director and the rest of the cast? Then, I got to meet you on stage and found that you're really down to earth, in a way that not many celebrities are. You were kind to everyone, and your performance wasn't bad. Whatever disappointment I had left at that point, I certainly wasn't about to take it out on you. By wasn't bad, you mean it wasn't great either. So, I'm guessing Mariu changed the script to simplify the protagonist, make her a dumbed-down version of the mechanical puppet that I could actually play. He did make some changes to the script, yes. Jaik, one of the other actors. He likes to collect Dr. Mary Yu's old drafts because he hopes to be a director himself one day. He also lives nearby. I can arrange for you to meet him at the tavern. Makes sense. 
I always see him talking to marry you. All right. Sorry to keep you waiting. Jillian brought me up to speed on the situation. I'm here to help however I can. Here, this is the script you're after. That's always the way with pen and paper drafts. Even the final script is full of last minute changes by the director. There should be a cleaner copy of the original script in here somewhere. Ugh, sorry, it's all a bit mixed up. I just grabbed the whole stack of paper since I was in a rush. No problem. Now activating search mode. I'll go through one page at a time. The protagonist returns to the ruins where she began and performs a dance in honor of her deceased companions. She dances until her joints have rusted stiff and mechanical parts are falling from her body. Hmm. Yep. That's not something a novice could hope to pull off after just a few months of rehearsals. Frankly, I think that the original script is much better, and the original lead is the best fit. Jillian, shall I go tell Mariu to put you back in the leading role? Huh? What? Are you serious? But the next show is at the Opera Epicles. It's such a huge opportunity. But not such a rare one for me, though, right? That's different. This isn't you as part of a magic duo. It's a chance to star as the main character in a show. You'll reach whole new heights of fame. Um, fame in small doses has its perks, but too much and I'll get overloaded. But if you play the lead, the fame will be yours and I get to be free. Sounds like a win-win, don't you think? It'll never work. There's no way Director Maryu or Maloney would ever agree to it. The set for Act 4 would need to change, as would all the marketing materials. And that would mean asking Maloney for a lot more Mora. Changing actors at the last minute is just too risky. If anything went wrong, it could bankrupt the whole troupe. Plus, Maloney's friends have already published a ton of articles saying how this is the role that Lynette was born to play. No one else can play the protagonist now. If Lynette quit the show and I took her place, if Lynette left, they'd sooner stop the whole show than let me take her place. Stop the whole show? But all the people in the troupe, months and months of everyone's hard work would all be for nothing.
You do? What is it? That's a bold plan. I'm in. You know, it's a little crazy, but it might actually work. N no way! It's not worth taking such a huge risk just for a chance to be in the spotlight! Jillian, you said before, whatever disappointment I had left, I wasn't about to take out on you. In other words, that disappointment is still there, but you've kept it bottled up inside. Be honest, you still hope to play the leading role, don't you? I... but the thought of putting so many people out just for my sake? You think they'd be put out? Hmm... That's not how I see it. Jillian, you were more dedicated than anyone during the rehearsals for the original script. We all saw how hard you worked for this role. And I think you know that unless we decide to make a stand here, the path we're on is only going to take us further and further from our dreams, all of us. So take it from me, you would not be putting us out. Not one bit. You guys... I... I... Okay. Let's do it. I will play my part. Yes! I knew you'd come around! All right, I'll let the rest of the troop know and we'll start preparing immediately. <sighs> Wonderful. This solves everything. Wait, but what about the threat letter? Do you have any idea who sent it? As long as we stick to the plan, I'll give up the lead role, so it won't matter anymore, right? But surely you want to know who it's from. If they're out there and no one's keeping an eye on them, what if they come looking for you? Um, I doubt they will. It's supposed to be a threat, but they didn't even say what would happen if I don't meet their demands. Plus, the handwriting is kind of childish. Doesn't look like a professional intimidator to me. Who knows? Maybe it was just a fan of yours having a moment. A fan? Of me? Maybe there's someone out there who really appreciates your talent. Even in the supporting roles. Mm, it's getting late. We should be leaving. Come on. I... I'm such an idiot. Sorry for manhandling you. You looked like you were seconds away from figuring out who sent the letter, so I had to act fast. It was Gina, Jillian's sister. Just because Lady Farina speaks highly of you, it doesn't mean you're all that! I'm so sorry. Gina's always been a strong-willed child. That's why I never let her visit me at work. I guess she must have snuck into the drinks reception and overheard our conversation with Farina. She idolizes Jillian both as an older sister and an actress. And she watched as the dream role Jillian had been waiting to play for so long got snatched away from her by some amateur who's never acted before. To make matters worse, all the critics were hailing this amateur as a perfect fit for the role. And even Fontaine's former biggest star was praising her abilities. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. Like I said, Getting angry at angsty teenagers is draining. Besides, if it was my younger brother or sister and they found out I'd been treated unfairly or had an opportunity stolen from me, they'd definitely do something far worse. I was in Jillian's position once. Back when Linny and I were starting out, before we got famous, we just had to take things a day at a time. Doing our shows, slowly trying to build up our reputation. So I can understand Gina's frustration. Still, she could definitely use some pro tips on how to write a threat letter. 
No, the way she looks at me is indignant. Frustrated, but not malicious. Plus, she didn't even try to hide how she felt. Whoever was giving me that evil stare was backstage. Blending into the crowd at a drinks reception is one thing, but trying to blend in backstage, where everyone's on high alert waiting to be called on stage, would be a lot more difficult. We'll find out who it is before too long. In two days' time, at the next show, I think it will become very clear. On that note, guess I'll see you at the Opera House. Bye for now. Oh, you're here! Lynette and Jillian are busy getting ready, so please come with me. That puppet in the middle. Is that Lynette? She's so pretty. It started. Keep your voice down. Wow. I thought it would be hard to follow, but in the end, it was actually very clear. Even though her face was expressionless and she didn't speak the whole time, I felt like I could really understand how the protagonist was feeling. Director Mary really is a master of his craft, and so is the actress in the lead role. I have a friend who saw the show on the opening day. They thought the critics overstated how good it was, but I gotta say, the protagonist is incredible. I can't believe it's only been a few days since the last show. Lynette's improved so much. Just, wow, I'm speechless. Words simply cannot do justice to the sheer excellence we witnessed from Lynette on stage today. Your pension for the hyperbolic strikes again, Almery. Clearly you weren't at a loss for words when you were writing your article. I saw you hand it to the journalist. Trying to get your critique into the papers the moment the show is over, are you? <laughs> well, you know how it is. The early critics get all the readers. Wouldn't you agree, Mary You? Uh, <laughs> Hmm? <sighs> What's the matter? Uh, cat got your tongue? Ah, the first half was a huge success. Even I could tell the acting was top tier. My uh, apologies, Mr. Maloney. Please excuse me for a second. I need to have a little talk with my actors. Oh, uh, very, very well. Hey, while you're at it, uh, this might be a good time to talk future collaborations with Lynette. <laughs> Are you guys sure this is going to work? What if Director Mary Yu pushes back? We're already halfway there. We can't back out now. All we need to do is stick to the plan. What is this plan that you're so intent on hiding from me, hmm? D Director Mary Yu, I, uh, I thought you were talking to Maloney and the critics. Korantan and Armory have both finished their articles. I went to greet them as a mere formality, but you seem to have availed yourselves of my absence during the first half to defy me. What have you done? Was that really Lynette playing the lead role? Ta-da! Director marry you? I was the one playing the lead role just now. I switched costumes and masks with Jillian so that I could be the protagonist's companion and stay out of the limelight. Lynette, why on earth would you do this? You know my acting is amateur. The only reason I'm being seen as a pro, let alone a pioneer, is because you have critics supporting the show. If they'd seen me in the leading role during the first half, they wouldn't be expecting anything more. But what happens now that they've seen Jillian in the role? If you force me to play the lead in the second half, they'll be wondering why is the actress suddenly giving such an underwhelming performance right at the climax of the whole story? These are just some of the questions that will be on everyone's minds during the second half. 
and those questions will follow them out the doors of the theater after the show ends. There's only one way for you to save your reputation, and that's to keep Jillian as the lead all the way to the end. Absolutely not! I'd sooner announce that we're having technical difficulties and need to stop the show! If I keep Jillian as the lead for the second half, what do you think will happen in the curtain call when she takes her mask off? Everyone will see that we've changed actors! What will your fans think? They're only here because of you, and what about all the critics who support you? If we get on the wrong side of them, it'll be the death of the whole show! There'd be tickets to refund, fines to pay for breach of contract, the whole troupe's hard work would go down the drain! Don't you see how much this would cost us? You can't just take a job on a whim, then abandon your responsibility the moment you don't feel like doing it anymore! You're playing games with other people's hopes and dreams! Director, marry you, please! You're not being fair to Lynette! Actually, Jillian, he's half right. I did kind of take this on a whim. But my responsibility here is making sure you get back the role that belongs to you. <laughs> and I guess part of that responsibility lies with me, considering I badgered you into accepting the job. <laughs> Sorry I'm a little late to the show. Work's been keeping me pretty busy lately. Linny? Uh, what do you want? Do you think you can snap your fingers and make all my problems magically disappear? That might be a little tricky, but instead, I could make something else magically appear. What's this? A draft complaint letter, my contract, your legal fees, reimbursement for the tickets, and an advance on the penalty fee for breach of contract. Mr. Mario, I'm stepping down from the leading role, regardless of whether you choose to cancel the rest of today's show. If you do suffer unforeseen financial losses from this, you're free to seek damages as per the contract. And if you want to file a lawsuit, there's a draft here that you can use if you need it. What? <laughs> I can't believe this. You're literally handing me a lawsuit against you with a straight face. Of course. All this mora, it's a pittance to you, isn't it? Must be nice to have the luxury of prior success and fame. Look at us. We're huge stars. One minute we want to go on stage, the next we feel like backing out of the contract. But that's okay. We're famous. We can afford it. You have no respect for other people's work. You're treating other people's hopes and dreams like a big joke. You don't give a hoot how much this show means to other people. You don't even care that the whole production might have to shut down because of you! That's not true. I do care. And I'm under no illusion as to how much this show means to you. Oh, brilliant deduction there. Of course it means a lot to me. This is my show. That's the only reason I asked you to be in it in the first place. Really? Then why do your eyes tell a different story? The way you look at me... It's full of contempt. Almost as if I've destroyed your work of art. What? I... I would never think that! A couple days ago, I asked some associates to do some digging for me. I was interested to know who else you invited to play the lead apart from Lynette. Surprise, surprise. Turns out that all the other famous actresses you asked either had prior commitments or weren't a good fit for the role. They all turned you down. And I would have turned you down too, if not for an unlikely set of coincidences. You didn't send those invitations because you were looking for a better actress than Jillian, but because your investor wanted a big name in your show, right? Director marry you. To get Maloney on your side, you chose to make Jillian the understudy, and then look for an opportunity for her to take the lead. I bet you were torn at first, weren't you? Do you stick to the tried and tested formula? Choose Lynette, use her celebrity to get the critics on your side so that you and your investors can line your pockets? Or do you choose Jillian? so that you and your longtime collaborator can stage the show of your dreams. 
the original, unedited version of the Lost Puppet. Oh, I... I didn't! I didn't betray myself! You mentioned prior success and fame earlier, but you're a well-known director yourself, with countless works to your name. Wouldn't that make you successful too? Or maybe, deep down, none of your current achievements really count as success to you. <sighs> right now, you have an opportunity to send Jillian onto that stage and perform the second half as you always imagined it, faithful to your original script. Your work would be displayed for all of Fontaine to see in its true, perfect form. Did... Did you say... Perfect? Or, will you act now before Maloney and the critics can protest and make your dream come true on the stage? And Jillian's dream. In fact, the dreams of the whole troupe. The whole troupe? Director Mariu? Actually, most of the money Lenny brought came from us. We all chipped in. We've worked with you for many years now. Your troupe has been here for you all the way from the empty theaters where we first performed to the Opera House today. We watched as you slowly started down a path you used to despise. The path of powerful connections, drinks receptions, backdoor deals with critics, and collaborations based on fame instead of talent. But... but this is just a temporary measure. I, I did it for the good of the troupe. And... And besides, this is how the whole industry works. Everyone else is doing it. Yes, we know. Back when you started, you had to bite the bullet and do these things to keep the troop afloat. But then what happened? You began to embrace these methods more and more, becoming so reliant on them that every show you put out is overhyped by the media, and every script you write is edited to suit some celebrity's needs. Surely you must have noticed what's happening. While we've been performing at bigger and bigger theaters with each show, the applause is getting quieter and quieter each night, and the criticism from people who've seen the show is growing. Maloney's friends are sycophants. They don't care if the audience is disappointed because the show doesn't live up to their glowing reviews. They praise the things they like and skirt around the things they don't. Look, I know everyone's using the same promotional tactics, but does that really make it okay? Well, it's... it's just a stopgap solution. I... As soon as I've made enough Mora, I'll stop. Things will be different next time. I promise. Next time, huh? Yeah. Next time, you won't use your connections. Next time, you won't pay off the critics. Next time, you'll let Julian play the lead. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. If you make some money once, you'll want to do it again, then again. Slowly but surely, you turn your back on your dreams. I won't turn my back on my dreams any longer, Director Maryu. Never again. Me neither. I had dreams too. What? Huh. The plot here seems a little different from what the review said. The protagonist wanted to return to the stage, so the puppets replaced all her parts with the latest ones available, built her a grand opera house, and summoned a huge audience. And in the end, she forgot herself amidst the applause and cheers of her fellow puppets. Hey, no spoilers! Huh? Wait, hang on, that's not even what's happening. The set has changed back to the one from the first act. Oh, Archons. Please let this work out. 
No need to be so nervous, Director Maryu. We only told you Lynette would be quitting the show to get you to make a decision. We wanted you to believe that this show would have to end after today, no matter what you decided. But in truth, I believe that if we choose our words carefully, there's no reason we can't get Maloney to come around and keep the show going. You really thought this plan through. <sighs> but I'm not upset about what you've done. What's worrying me now isn't how Maloney will react or whether the show will get cancelled. It's the audience. I've always thought the original script is better, but will it move them like I've always hoped? When Jillian does her curtain call, will they applaud her? What if people only came to see the show for Lynette? And because of the reviews, what if they don't really care about the show at all? It feels like I've been hiding inside my safe little castle for too long. And now I'm scared to go outside the walls and hear what people really think. We're right here with you. We'll watch it to the end. Wow. Okay, this ending is much better. I love how they brought back the set from Act One and gave it a whole new meaning. What a fantastic twist. Time for the curtain call. It's the moment of truth. The applause continue after I take off the mask. I could always leave my mask on. You never know. And this is what fame looks like, when it's truly deserved. <laughs> Jillian, you were amazing! Syra was tearing up when you did your final solo dance. Ah, uh, well, so are you. Really? I was so nervous. My legs felt like they turned to jelly. What looked like an actor unsteady on her feet was in fact a poignant expression of the protagonist's frailty in her last moments. Or whatever. <sighs> hey, Mario! What the heck was that? Why wasn't Lynette playing the lead? Our articles are already going to press. You better have a good explanation for this. Um... It was my... Hey, now, it was all of our... Hold on. The decision was mine, and mine alone. They had nothing to do with it. If you have any concerns, gentlemen, then please direct them to me. Marry you? So it was you? Well, then, I trust you'll have no objection to me pulling the plug on this production. I... Uh... <sighs> Director Maryu, Mr. Maloney, what on earth is going on? Why was Lynette not in the lead role? It took a lot of convincing for me for her to accept the role, and I had to turn down some big work opportunities to come and watch her performance today. You have some explaining to do. Uh, Lenny, it was all his idea. Maryu, uh, explain yourself. Wait. Lenny, as a matter of fact, this was a piece of performance art. In this play, the masks and costumes serve to obscure the differences between characters, and by extension, the difference between human and machine. We took that idea to the next level with an actor swap, blurring the lines between one performer and the next. So, it's in service of the ambitious artistic goals of the production. Uh, what? It's similar to deceiving the audience in a magic show. We employed this technique as a means of breaking the fourth wall. 
It allows the audience to more intuitively understand the cognitive dissonance felt by the protagonist as a machine trying to reconcile the notion of her humanity. The audience's experience mirrors the protagonist's own confusion and becomes part of the artistic performance itself. Hold up! What is this nonsense? Oh, I see. Well, bravo, Director Maryu. You even had me fooled. That's probably more because you just don't really understand avant-garde art very well, Lenny. Maybe so, maybe so. Well, perhaps it went over my head, but I'm sure our experts here saw the whole thing coming a mile away. Uh, uh, um... You must have worked it out by the end of the first half, surely. Mr. Amory, I just heard that you managed to write your review after just the first two acts. Ahem. <clears throat> Yes, you're right. Director Mary, you and I are old friends. You should have said something. Then I could have played along even better. <clears throat> yes, well, to deceive the audience, you must first deceive your closest companions. I have to give credit to Lynette and her experience in performing magic. That's what inspired me to take my art to the next level. Hmm? You mean your show was partly inspired by Lynette's background in magic? Well, in that case, I'll have to plug it to everyone I know. <sighs> Unfortunately, I think Mr. Maloney is going to cancel the show. Cancel the show? Mr. Maloney, is this true? Uh, while I accept that deceiving the audience in the manner you did uh, certainly has artistic merit, this is not a magic show, and we don't want our audience demanding their money back. A very valid criticism, and one that I humbly accept. If that happens, we're prepared to reimburse and apologize to any audience members who weren't satisfied with the experience. Plus, it looks like Jillian is better than me at delivering the excellence people want to see. I'm sure audiences will be very happy with the show if she's allowed to stay in the leading role. Maloney, uh, I believe there should still be time to tweak my article. From the look on Lynette's face, I think she's being sincere. Oh, one other thing. We managed to get a meeting with Lady Farina earlier. All thanks to the Traveler's reputation, of course. Anyway, she agreed to write a review focusing on Jillian's performance and the quality of the show as a whole. She promised to give her honest opinion. And I'm sure today's audience will be discussing her performance, too. There's sure to be a variety of opinions. Oh, I mean, art at its finest, clearly. Uh, but I'll have to give it some thought before I decide exactly what to write. Oh, of course. Always good to put some thought into these things. Especially now, with a growing range of voices out there. I imagine competition for readers becomes more fierce when everyone's discussing the topic. <sighs> Quarantan, Amory, let's go. Gina? You snuck in? When? I thought I told you no visiting me at work. I'm sorry, Jillian, but I had to come. Do you think this move needs jazzing up a little? Not jazzing up, per se. I was thinking more like break it down, you know? <sighs> Thank you both so much. Without the two of you, who knows how much further down that cynical path I would have gone. I always told myself that once I'd made enough Mora, I'd get back to doing what I loved. But somewhere along the way, I started to lose sight of what that was. <laughs> Just like those critics with their dishonest reviews, I became all about the trappings of success. At the expense of the art itself. You're right. Yes. I'm a very lucky man. Anyway, enough about my problems. What are we going to do about the threat letter that Lynette received? I've been looking into it a lot over the past couple of days, but it doesn't seem like it was one of our competitors after all. Ah, yes, about that. Um, Lynette, do you 
I have a moment. <laughs> Wait. You're Jillian's sister, right? I'm sorry. Gina insisted on coming to see Lynette. I couldn't stop her. Lynette, I'm sorry! Uh... of Sandra? And you said some mean things to me? As I recall, you were only trying to look out for your sister. It was just a few words spoken in anger. Don't worry. Whatever it was you said, I've already forgotten. Oh. <laughs> I see. Well, it sounds like Gina knows what she did was wrong. Owning up to your mistakes and committing to do better in the future is what counts. I understand that feeling of wanting to stand up for your family when they're being mistreated. Really, I do. But next time, maybe consider a different tactic? Something you can pull off more effectively and without arousing suspicion. Got it. Thank you, Lynette. Why do I feel like I'm missing something here? Hey, here you are. I was wondering where you'd all run off to. Great! Everyone's in one place. That makes this so much easier. <laughs> what do you think? It's group photo time! We have to commemorate the debut of the Lost Puppet Director's Edition. Okay, everyone, we all have pretty awkward smiles on our faces in the photo from Hotel de Boer, so this time, no forced smiles allowed. Oh, am I really not allowed to force a smile? I'll try, I suppose. I think I can manage. Lynette, Traveler, come on! You two should be right in the middle. Three, two, one, smile! <sighs> Thank you both so much. Without the two of you, who knows how much further down that cinema... I always told myself that... <laughs> just like those critics with their... You're right. Yes. Anyway, enough about my... I've been looking into it all... Ah, yes. Um, Lynette, do you... Mm -hmm. Wait. I'm sorry. Lynette! Uh... That letter... I was the one who wrote it. What? Gina? So it was you? Director, it's time for... Oh, okay. Weird energy here. I think we came at a bad time. Lynette, I... Gina must have been worried sick about me. I'm sure even she wouldn't do something so stupid if she was in her right mind. I'm so sorry. I promise I'll make it up to you somehow. Jillian, no! This is completely my fault, and I'm the one who should have to bear the consequences. I got the wrong end of the stick and completely misjudged Lynette. Well, since I haven't actually suffered any losses, seeking redress could be difficult. Maybe we could just let this one slide? Really? Are you sure? After all, Gina wouldn't be the first person to ever misjudge me, right? Ah, uh, true. True. In any case, I think we can all agree it was a misunderstanding and nothing more. No need to overcomplicate things. But still, I was wrong to write that letter. I should own up to my actions, make it up to you in some way. Hmm. If that's what you really want, then how about helping out backstage? Uh-huh. Backstage? The crew could always use an extra hand. Plus, it'll give your older sister a chance to keep an eye on you. And stop you getting into any more trouble. Thank you, Lynette. Really, thank you so much. Ah. <sighs> <sighs> 
is it? Hmm, I'm so much more at home here in the audience. I get to sit on a comfy seat, and I don't have to activate my energy-consuming modes all the time. Mary, you said she's a very promising young actress, and she has natural chemistry with her older sister. In their capable hands, the show doesn't need me to attract an audience anymore. Phew, freedom at last. Hmm, fame is more trouble than it's worth. I'd rather leave that side of things to my brother and the others. I'm happiest when I get to sit in a quiet place, watch them do their thing, and cheer them on. Yep, exactly like I'm doing now. Huh, I didn't like that. Clearly, there's some design flaws to- Let's see... Which card- Huh? What you're saying is... Since nobody's come looking... I can just... Keep hanging out with Bonnie for a bit longer? Is that really okay? a good point. Okay, well, assuming Bonnie hasn't strayed too far from where she went missing, there's a chance we might bump into her owner in either the Steenbird offices or the restaurant. So, stick around here in standby mode? Yeah, that suits me. Oh, good idea. Bonnie's definitely hungry. Hmm, may as well. We could be here a while. Hmm... When I was trying to find somewhere I could space out earlier... Uh, I mean, collect my thoughts... I figured the cafe might be a good shot. Hmm... Alright then. Plan of action? Spend the whole day spacing out. Uh, I mean... In standby mode. Candlelight. 